UNLV is not known as a football school. The Running Rebels are definitely known as a historic basketball program, and while the basketball program has fallen on hard times, the football program is surprisingly providing a light for the future. As conference realignment is really starting to ramp up, UNLV is hoping to get a piece of the pie and become a part of a bigger conference. With their basketball history, their great location in Las Vegas, and the amount of money this program has, UNLV is a sleeping giant that could easily become a Power 5 school, and maybe their football program will become something. So far, the Rebels are off to a 4-1 start, they have one of the best young coaches in the nation, and they are currently shocking the college football world. In today's video, I want to talk about the rise of UNLV football, how they've gotten to this point, and how this team could be a sleeping giant. But before we get started, nearly 80% of you guys are not subscribed to the channel. Please be sure to hit the subscribe button, leave a like if you want to support the channel, turn on notifications, and let me know another player, team, or topic I can cover next. Now, let's get started and talk about the rise of the Running Rebels. UNLV is not a football powerhouse by any means, but they have had a couple of good seasons in their tenure. For a while, the team was an independent, before they eventually moved up to the Mountain West where they are now. Unfortunately, since the year 2000, UNLV football has been a dumpster fire. The Rebels went 8-5 and five under head coach John Robinson in the year 2000, before they go 4-7, and 5-7, and, and eventually 2-9 and nine before he was canned. In 2005, the Rebels brought in Mike Sanford as their new head coach, and he saw no success. Somehow, he got five years there, and in his time, he went 2-9, and 2-10, and 2-10, and 5-7, and 5-7. And and there was pretty much no improvement there, and half a decade later, they were on to their next coach without a bowl appearance. In 2010, they would hire Bobby Houck to be their new head coach, hopefully I said that right, and once again, they wouldn't see a whole lot of success. The team went 2-11, and then 2-10, and then 2-11 and again. You may be wondering why they played 13 games, and that's because they played Hawaii. Somehow though, the Rebels would have a breakthrough season in 2013, as the team would actually go 7-6. and six. They'd end up making their first bowl game in what seemed to be an eternity, and they'd end up losing to North Texas in the heart of Dallas Bowl. Unfortunately, after that fluke year, Hawk would go back to his losing ways as they go 2-11. and 11. He was eventually fired, and in came their next head coach, Tony Sanchez. Just like the previous two coaches, Sanchez would get five years to turn around the UNLV program, and he never finished higher than third in the Mountain West Western Division. The team went 3-9, and nine, then 4-8, and eight, then 5-7, and seven, then 4-8, and eight, and then 4-8 and eight again. At this point, I almost feel bad for them, as they could just seemingly never get to a bowl game, and they were non-competitive, and football was a dead sport there. It didn't help that the basketball team was also terrible at the time as well, and they would need a coach who actually knew what he was doing and could turn this thing around. Who did they look to? Well, they'd go out and get Marcus Arroyo. He played quarterback back at San Jose State in the early 2000s, and he'd eventually go into coaching. He'd spend time at San Jose State, Prairie View A&M, California, Cal, Southern Miss, and even with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. He got his first big college job as he became the running backs coach at Oklahoma State in 2015 and 2016, before he became the co-offensive coordinator at Oregon in 2017. This was during the Willie Taggart era, but when Crystal Ball came in, he made Arroyo the offensive coordinator. In 2019, he'd help coach up Justin Herbert as the Ducks would win the Northern Division and go beat Utah in the Pac-12 Conference Championship game. He'd also lead them to a win in the Rose Bowl, was a good recruiter, and now had a ton of experience. He was the kind of guy who was slowly flying up the coaching ladder, but then he decided to take a death sentence. He took the head coaching job at UNLV. As I said, UNLV had made one bowl game in seemingly the last 20 years, so why on earth would he go there? Well, their new athletic director saw a couple of things in him. One, he was a young coach at only 39 years old, Secondly, Oregon was a top 15 team in scoring, and thirdly, he helped the Ducks sign multiple top-ranked recruiting classes in the Pac-12. They wanted a young guy who had experience at a winning program, and more importantly, had the backing of a lot of money. We all know what Phil Knight has done for that Oregon program, but UNLV is in a similar spot. The Raiders had recently moved there, Allegiant Stadium was built, and Las Vegas was starting to become a sports hotbed. They also decided to invest a ton of money into the program, as they spent $34 million on a new football complex. They wanted to hire a guy who was both under the radar, and someone who had a high ceiling. That is exactly what Arroyo was. Arroyo had this to say when he got hired, quote, UNLV Athletics is a department on the rise, and my family and I are thrilled to be a part of the Running Rebel family during this special time. The uniqueness of Las Vegas is unrivaled, and the opportunity to train, practice, and compete in one of the world's most vibrant cities cannot be understated. We will work tirelessly to elevate UNLV football to the championship caliber program that it is positioned to be. Whoa, 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 did he say championships? UNLV football was barely winning any games, let alone conference games, let alone national championships. This guy had to be crazy, and that is exactly why UNLV hired him. 
Maybe he'd be so crazy that he could actually turn things around. Unfortunately, it'd be a ridiculously tough first year, as with all the restrictions going on on the West Coast and everything going on in the world, Arroyo would have to build a bad football program up with pretty much no help and the world stacked against him. At quarterback, Max Gilliam came over from California, and then both Charles Williams and Kyle Williams became the top two weapons. Fortunately, this didn't lead to a whole lot, as UNLV got blown out in every single game. They lost 34-6 against San Diego State, 37-19 against Nevada, 40-27 against Fresno State, 34-17 against San Jose State, 45-14 against Wyoming, and 38-21 against Hawaii. The Rebels had gone 0-6 in their first year under Arroyo, and they weren't even competitive, it seemed. Many wondered if Arroyo was the right guy for the job. 2021 did very little to change that narrative. Interestingly enough, they actually brought in Tate Martell, but Cameron Freall would become the quarterback. Charles Williams became an 1,000-yard rusher for them and had 15 touchdowns, but this translated to pretty much nothing in wins. Their only two wins came against New Mexico and Hawaii, and they lost all 10 of their other games. They were competitive against number 19 San Diego State, lost by a touchdown to San Jose State, lost by four to Utah State, lost by one touchdown to UTSA, lost by one score to number 22 Fresno State, and lost a double overtime to Eastern Washington. While this team only won two games, they looked a lot more competitive, and they played well against teams who were in the top 25. Little did anyone know, Arroyo was on the cusp of having his Rebels break out. He did a tremendous job in the transfer portal. He brought in former Michigan State All-Conference receiver Ricky White, got a former running back from Louisville by the name of Aiden Robbins, a linebacker from Florida State by the name of Jordan Eubank, an offensive tackle from SMU named Kobe Bryant, and then what was supposed to be a big one, he got Harrison Bailey. At one time, Bailey was a near five-star recruit from the state of Georgia, and after flaming out pretty quickly at Tennessee, Bailey could have came and resurrected that program. Instead, though, they found their own guys. Doug Broomfield was not highly recruited, but after sitting on the bench for two years, he got his chance this year and has been tremendous. He's thrown for over 1,200 yards with eight touchdowns and two interceptions. He also has five touchdowns on the ground and has truly been a dual-threat quarterback. At running back, Aiden Robbins has blossomed into a star. He's currently top five in college football in multiple areas as he has 506 yards and eight touchdowns while averaging five yards per carry. At receiver, they found two great players in former Michigan State guy Ricky White and then Kyle Williams. They've combined for nearly 600 yards and seven touchdowns, and the defense has also been solid. In their first five games, they have not allowed more than 27 points. In week one, they would kill Idaho State before going on the road in nearly upsetting Cal. California is actually a pretty decent team, and UNLV was in that game until the finish. Despite the loss there, this was truly a moral victory for them. In week three, they'd kill North Texas 58 to 27, and then they'd go on the road and beat Utah State 34 to 24. This past Friday, they beat New Mexico 31 to 20, and right now, the Rebels are four and one with a two and zero record. This is the best start of this century for UNLV football. Arroyo is doing a great job. They have some star players, and they're doing it at the right time. As I said, with conference expansion happening, UNLV could punch their ticket to the next level. They already have an historic basketball program and that is something the Pac-12 would gladly take. With USC and UCLA leaving, why not take a flyer on UNLV? They're already going to bring that basketball history to them, and now, if football's good, they could be even better. They've already pumped a lot of money into facilities, they're now winning games, they're stationed in Las Vegas, there's tons of resources in the area, recruits would want to play there, and if they're in a bigger conference, they're going to start signing better recruiting classes, winning more games, and growing as a program. But how will they do the remainder of the year? Well, they're going to go play San Jose State this Friday, and if they can win that, they're going to have a showdown with Air Force. This could be the game of the year in the Mountain West, and if they can somehow win that, they're going to go on the road and play Notre Dame. Imagine if UNLV is somehow 6-1 going into that game, it would just blow my mind. Obviously, I don't think they're going to win it, and I don't think they're going to beat Air Force either, but I think they should win the other five games on their schedule. I could definitely see a world in which the Rebels go 9-3 and, and make a pretty decent bowl game. Marcus Arroyo is doing a tremendous job down there in Las Vegas. UNLV football is on the rise. It's fun to watch, and the sky could be the limit for them. But what do you think? If you're a UNLV fan, what do you think about the future of the program? If you're an outsider, is UNLV a sleeping giant with the potential to be great? Let me know another school, situation, or team I could take a look at next. Before you go, don't forget to leave a like, subscribe if you're new, and check out all my other videos on the end screen, including my rise of UCLA. Hope to see you guys again soon, but until next time, peace.